Hello, I'm John Shopton. and I'm uh, very happy to welcome you this evening to uh, our final Holloway Poetry Reading Series, uh, reading of this uh, spring. Uh, our featured poet tonight is Kimiko Han. Welcome, Kimiko. I'm happy to, that you could come out for a reading. Um, I'd like, uh, before I go any further, to uh, thank Rosa Martinez for tonight and all the nights this spring. Uh, without Rosa Martinez, the Holloway Poetry Reading Series would just be a phrase with no reality <laughs> attached. And so I want to thank you, Rosa. I really <laughs> appreciate you so much. Uh, and that's, that's you know, heartfelt and angst, <laughs> reinforced uh, gratitude. Um, Megan Pugh is going to uh, open the poetry reading. Tonight, Megan is a grad student in English here. Uh, she'll be introduced by another graduate student poet, uh, Jillian Osborne. Um, and then Charity Katz will say a few words of introduction to, uh, uh, for Kimiko Han, who will doubtless read some poems for us. Um, so welcome, everyone. And uh, Jillian, thank you. Hello. <laughs> so. Megan Pugh's poems are about the problems of regionalism, the disorientations of a particular deeply American region, a place that one of her students called the Deep Dark South. As a graduate student in the English department here, Megan has taught classes on the southernization of American culture and on the various unrests of the 1930s. Her critical writing explores the legacies of American movement, how the innovations of Bill Bojangles Robinson turn up in the tap dancing, ballrooming escapades of Fred and Ginger, or how Agnes DeMille trains her ballet dancers to widen their hips into cowboys and swagger a little more, even as they continue to plie and pirouette. At other times, she's served as the ladylike co-host of a Southern music radio show kept a blog documenting cooking projects inspired by, I'm sorry, that keeps popping. Um, kept a blog documenting cooking projects inspired by historic cookbooks, including Martha Washington's, and written journalistic pieces chronicling figures from a pro wrestler turned inspirational speaker to the king of pop himself, old moonwalking MJ. I bring up all these other scholarly and writerly interests of Megan's because I think that her passions inform one another that despite the many forms her writing and thinking take, these different forms are invested in a similar restlessness, a similarly troubled investigation of the persistent presence of history in our daily lives. So if you get anything from this introduction, you should get this, that Megan Pugh is obsessed with history, completely obsessed with both the delights and the darkness of how American history makes us and haunts us. So you, you'll hear a fascination in these poems, a fascination with the way the textures and sounds and tastes of the historical show up in our homes, with the way objects, places, and figures only half conceal their past. You'll sense a pleasure too, a pleasure that comes from friends, from words reveling in their evocative capabilities. But there's also a specter of doubt here, a creepiness surfacing in the melancholy voices of the dead masquerading as the living. And finally, I think you'll feel a wariness in these poems, a wariness that history, like a horse and a rider coming from behind along a long river, might overtake us at any moment. Please join me in welcoming Megan Pugh. <laughs> Um, I'm thrilled to be up here reading tonight with Kimiko Han. Um, before I get started, I just want to thank Rosa and John for putting everything together. Um, thank all of y'all for coming out. And, um, and Jillian, thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, at least a few of y'all know that Jillian and I were housemates for a couple of years. And sometimes while one of us was making dinner, the other one would read poems out loud. 
Um, and occasionally it would be our own stuff, but more often it would be someone like Frank O'Hara or Kenneth Koch who would kind of rev you up as you were chopping onions. Um, and it's, it's something I really miss. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I'm sorry we're not all sharing a home-cooked meal tonight. Although, um, I don't think it would really be fair to ask Jillian to do that, especially in the short time during which I'll be reading. I'm going to start with a poem called Running in Place. They say history hurt because mountaintops are craggy. We know the sun will set sooner tonight than the night before. When a camera obscura brings the whole neighborhood into the den, we'll know where we are. And when we put ice on our heads to simulate winter, it melts down our faces to puddle in the smalls of our chests. They used to think heat made you drawl, languish in rituals like rocking chairs, irises nodding assent. Was it here that she killed a copperhead with a hoe? Was he cataloging maps in a weatherless vault while I read about a man on the trolley hiding beneath a woman's voluminous skirts when the city sacked itself? Or already on his way home, watching geese set the landscape in motion by moving through it? We thought tomatoes would crawl up cages from the hay when we'd be acting of our own accord to make captions for a book of obelisks, waking early to iron rumpled shirts. The next poem is called Chez Paris, um, but I kind of like you to know that Paris is spelled P-A-R-E-E. -E. It's a very swanky name of a very swanky Chicago nightclub um, that was open from the 30s to the 60s. Chez Paris. Spades signal a landscape laden with gardenias, brick foundations in the grass. We are unlikely to begin the story of our lives with our great-grandparents, so I was surprised when she asked me where my people were from, and she didn't mean my hometown, but the old country. I've never seen that muddy farm or learned to spell its name. He liked walking home in the rain and molasses on his pancakes. When the Carolina Square Dancers went to Chicago, they wore their Sunday best. Winking at a friend at a formal reception, Poke salads, my meat, and my bread will be till I'm dead. Howdy, says Minnie Pearl. I'd like to be the first to kiss you for your birthday. I'd love that, says Hank, but I'm already dead. So there are three major characters in the next poem, um, all of whom moved to Memphis, which is where I grew up. One of them you've heard of, the other two are Hazel and Elton. Um, they were my father's parents, whom I never knew, but I've been obsessively reading the little bundle of letters in one journal that um, we still have of them, which I don't know, I don't know if that's terribly important for your understanding, but bonus tidbit. Called her sweetheart. Watching Blue Hawaii, the father from Georgia overseeing the pineapple plantation, ping pong the shuffling servant waiting on the family, Natives playing music, shrewish Angela Lansbury asking for some sugar, and in the middle of this nonsense, Elvis, the bad boy making good, singing Can't Help Falling in Love with You with the music box, is like seeing emerge from a pasteboard medicine show, the ghost of someone you loved, pantomiming a secret you forgot he knew. They took a picture of every state line they crossed. Their parents had never gone more than 200 miles from home. Dancing on a plank between two saw horses, hollering heel and toe catch a fire, old Virginie never tire. When Love walked onto the beach and said, we can stay there forever, Elton was playing fiddle by ear on Farmer Gray's early morning farm hour, WSPA Spartanburg. Never cut a record, and the photo, he's young and afraid. Driving through North Carolina with Hazel, he wrote, we are down to the land of beautiful misses who like to eat ice cream in the street. Baby, you're so square. Rain made the river look clumsy. He wrote, I shall miss Hazel terribly. And the gentle strumming of the guitar reminds her of swimming in the Waccamaw, her brother resplendent riding his pet bull through the unpainted house to make their mama who dipped snuff mad. Who'll sweep the dirt yard? 
18,000 Oklahomans convinced Steve Allen to have Elvis on, but he had to wear a tux and stand beside a basset hound in a top hat. He's saying, I want you, I need you, I love you. Staccato and surly, I'm getting out of here. We got a new washing machine, Hazel wrote to them back on the farm. Our son got stitches. I got cobalt treatments. The grass turned brown enough to burn, the timber tall enough to cut for the casino. He went to war where men made fun of how he talked. Their Yankee sons and daughters wore pompadours and swooned. He wrote her sister in secret when she was dying. Wouldn't have time to go home. Said, if I had to stand still and sing, I'd be lost. Didn't grow up rich, lulled his head to register surprise beneath the cleagues. This is a real decent and kind boy, said Ed Sullivan. Can't say how long. <clears throat> Excuse me. We won't die of galloping consumption, whooping cough, drowning in a flooded dugout, falling from a pecan tree in a grove of pecan trees and getting devoured by panthers, bit by snakes. We'll die of cancer, car wrecks, plane crashes, shot walking the dog, heart attacks. If I told you my great-great-grandpa kept a second family in a sharecropper's shack, kids fighting across the fence, real wife delivering food to the second wife without speaking, you might say picturesque. Today we're on the prowl for glamour and employment. I want to check you for ticks, creek bake in the company of water moccasins. Pauline fetched a glass, mixed a Coca-Cola, and pretended not to know her bastard kin. A song existed, but I found it best to forget it. We won't die of asphyxiation, cholera, or loneliness. Holes poked in the top of a mason jar of lightning bugs. Before her death, she confessed to killings she hadn't done. The Kennedy boys, the good doctor, deer hung from the rafters drained of blood. Um, so I, I sent that poem to a friend of mine who lives in Kansas, and he wrote me this kind of ornery email back telling me that he refused to believe that he couldn't die in all of these supposedly outmoded ways, and that in fact he had already had several close calls. Um, so on the off chance, William, that you ever listen to this podcast, um, please be careful. The next one just is a little prose poem that doesn't have a title. Collecting scuppernongs that pooled on the sides of the river, saying, meet me, dear little Lindy, by the watermelon vine. He sat in a spare and bottomless chair, his knees up by his chin, and in his hunger for bacon and cornbread, cared not. They named their dog Teddy, but after Roosevelt invited Booker T. Washington to the White House, they changed the dog's name. We wanted to smell magnolias, but we smelled sulfur. They say it quenches your thirst, but I don't intend to try it. Um, so I have a bunch of poems that are all called either libraries or diaries, um, and all of them are sort of both libraries and diaries and also not really libraries or diaries. Um, but I'm gonna read a couple of those, um, both of which are library poems. Libraries. Ladies shaped by so many whalebones and bustles, you couldn't tell how a body looked until you married it. Spent his childhood cleaning spittoons in the general store and picking up horse dung out front. Couldn't tell anyone her feelings. Saved money to buy ice cream. A song existed, but my remembrance is poor. Jimmy Dean leaning on a piano with a dog-shaped puppet and Johnny Cash imitating Elvis your cover of Thin Lizzy before we ran into the ocean on a cold day, my jeans tied on my legs, and if you'd wanted, you could have thrown me in. The sharecropper offered the interviewer coffee that smelled of moldering corn stalks. She couldn't well refuse, so she pretended coffee would make her stay awake. Magazine ads on the walls won't stop bugs from getting in and gnawing at you in your sleep. Walking in the cemetery with an old maid aunt who tells you stories about the dead prepares you to hide behind the worn out pages of an atlas or, in Louise's case, to play a ghost in Giselle. Said I need more confidence. Said put others first. 
When the music got into his feet, he danced with a cup of water on his head. They moved from farm to farm like circus folk, setting up tents in the dark for the impossible feat of getting out of debt. Ornery land. You're so handsome and so tall and so hard to get, said Cousin Minnie. Dropped her slip to the rug with a snap, took a nip for his nerves. Too skittish to shoot the man with the moonshine still, I wrote this song myself about a girl tallying out-of-state license plates on a dirt road, and yes, why not, longing. If you have no orchard, you have to buy from trucks. This one, this is another library poem, but it's a little different. I kind of assume the persona of a river rat roused about type who you might have run into on the Mississippi in the early 19th century, sort of. Libraries. After clinging to the trouble you know like an old maid showing off her grandma's rusty jewelry, eating too many prawns for breakfast at the Pulaski Hotel, getting in fights on a flatboat, that you'll never wear the Mississippi champion's red turkey feather in your hat. Annie Christmas is too tough with her overalls, mustache, bordello, and barrels of booze. You learn to let go. She accused me of being evasive, but I like this more than hashing out dead love affairs, because who wants to know when you can dance a hornpipe on deck and roast corn in the open air? Patching up overalls before they get holes, since holes will come, leaving the glades when the sawgrass grows. I can shaw the ear off a buffalo. I was raised on gator's milk. I wrestled the growl off a bear. I guzzled Tabasco. Can't float that mess upstream, so you chop it to pieces you burn. The hurricane blew crooked roads straight. Someone wakes you in a stagecoach, makes you walk across a ravine on a mossy log under the moon. You're frightened, but you do it. And with your last step, yop. Um, so the last poem I'm going to read is about parties, and to the best of my recollection, it's all true, um, or it might as well be. It could be true. Can't stop, won't stop. I wish I hadn't gone to the party with the desperate bankers playing beer pong and drinking. I'm going to start over because those words didn't come out right. I wish I hadn't gone to the party with the desperate bankers playing beer pong and drinking pomegranate martinis, though thankfully, G was there too, lamenting the two bright lights, real estate, and alma maters. At a Wyoming 4th of July party, Tom said they set fireworks off from their heads. I'm glad I wasn't there, or in Clearwater, where ours friends shotgun beers around a bonfire wearing adult diapers so they could piss themselves. At a warehouse party, Jeff drank too many sparks and demanded punk rock covers of Willie Nelson songs. And someone convinced his friends to have a party where they bike from one house to the next, drinking margaritas and plastic cups. This solves a common problem. The consummate hostess, so busy shuttling hors d'oeuvres on silver trays, she can't go around on her own. I'd like to throw a crawfish boil, but they don't sell crawfish in San Francisco, so I might have to settle for shrimp. Donut parties, hobo parties, first flight anniversary parties, mule day parties, Labor Day picnics, New Year's with noisemakers and paper hats. We wanted to have a Boston tea party, but some other people took that over. And anyway, who wants to throw drinks in the ocean? Children have themes more successfully than adults, though some adults dress up whenever they can, as at the notorious desert carnival that shall remain nameless. Masked balls require partial costumes, have an air of civility since you can pretend you're in Renaissance Venice. Once the face is hidden, you pay more attention to ankles, arms, and necks. Does the tilt of the head mean she's deciding whether to regret having come or hoping that man will go thither if she catches his eye? Birthday parties, anniversary parties, and coconut cracking cocktail parties with paper umbrellas to stick in your drinks, your hair, and the hair of obliging guests. Parties with cakes, parties with girls popping out of cakes, parties where your skirt's so tight you can't sit down and so must dance all night. Barbecues, clam bakes, barn raisings, surprise parties when you know what's coming or don't. People in bathrooms fixing their makeup at parties, 
or in bathrooms crying drunkenly at parties, or at parties fucking in bathrooms, discreetly smoking out the open window in bathrooms at parties without a porch or stoop. A balcony is a lovely place to take a respite from a party for some fresh air, though at garden parties, you're in fresh air all the time and may prefer the quiet of a kitchen. You can always volunteer to do the dishes. Getting phone numbers at parties or, like Ben, asking for phone numbers from people you know have boyfriends, not because you're interested in them, but because you want people to know you're not interested in your own date. The cops broke up a party on the beach and ticketed Nikki for walking to a party down the street with the plastic cup of Jameson and Ginger. Young men setting a couch on fire at a frat party where spilled beer sticks on the floor like a sugary glaze. Girls putting toothpaste in other girls' hair at slumber parties. A party in a house that's bigger than it seems, so each room is its own party. Parties where you sit on someone's lap inappropriately, Couples who make out at parties or sleep with the wrong people. I did this in a guilt rack nightmare, and though I woke up innocent and alone, I was horrified I could hurt you in my unconscious life and never told you what had happened. Greeting the apocalypse with singing parties, parties that spread the flu, and in hotel rooms where someone ODs or the artist decides to paint the walls and leave his host with a hefty bill. Someone climbing out the window on a rope of white sheets. Crashing a party with so many friends, it becomes your party. Hosting a party, crashed by a friend you didn't know would be in town and haven't seen for years. By an ex you never wanted to see again and don't know how to greet. Orientation parties where you, you eat pretzels instead of meeting people. Pre-parties, toga parties, after parties, sharing notes after the after party. Sometimes we wish the party could keep on going. Champagne soused wedding guests, jumping in the pool, turning the reception into a Marco Polo party, and with dawn, a hungover breakfast party, greasy eggs, toast, well wishes. But at other times, we want the house to ourselves. Clear afternoon night, light, the radio on. Not that parties can't be plenty intimate, as when Andy and I stayed in the corner talking to Poppy and that girl we never saw again, then twisted like old people in our everyday clothes when you pulled me outside to take a walk in the middle of my own party, and I went. Thank y'all. Okay, so, whoa. Um, does this sound vaguely normal? Um, okay, good. Kimiko Han is the author of eight collections of poetry, including The Narrow Interior, The Narrow Road to the Interior, The Artist's Daughter, Mosquito and Ant, Volatile, The Unbearable Heart, and most recently, Toxic Flora. She's received a slew of awards, an American Book Award, a Leela Wallace Reader's Digest Award, the Shelley Memorial Award, an Association of Asian American Studies Literature Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, to name a few. She's a distinguished professor in the MFA program at Queens College, CUNY, in creative writing and literary translation. But I'm here to say a few words about her mesmerizing poems, poems that shift ground and take their leave quickly, and poems that persist and insist on the connections available and waiting to be traced between the structurally dissimilar and the apparently unresembling. In Kimiko Han's poetry, deceit is a form of cleverness, evolutionary or otherwise. Of the bee orchid's strange posture and of the nothing it offers visiting insects, she writes, what to make of highly evolved beauty bent on deception as survival. Han's poems attest to the fragility and fierceness of life's most ordinary desires, desires elemental and casual enough to make their home in the zoihitsu, a form we're probably most familiar with from Sei Shonigan's The Pillow Book, a form whose name implies to follow in the stroke of a brush, thus suggesting a kind of ease and randomness. Han's poems take up the zoihitsu, revealing it to be startlingly precise and, perhaps because unplanned, receptive to obsession impulse, cycling returns, and escape. The Zoihitsu's companions might be the terse elegy, 
and the fairy tale's strange bargaining with the animal and spirit world, a bargaining one undertakes in desperation or because one dares to bargain. There is an ardor for language in these poems, both the love of proper names and the love of language which refuses to nominate. In Toxic Flower, Han writes, there is something vital about the Passiflora Alliriculata, which over a million years varied its cyanogens to discourage feasting insects, although the Heliconius butterfly resolutely adapted. That was hard to say. <laughs> In Wisteria, a poem of mourning, a Zoihitsu drawing on Roland Barthes, the pleasures of the text, Life magazine, and snippets of sympathy cards, Han writes, because there are always words, just as bear, lily, orbit, are words for the nouns we count on. In Hun's work, we find the wonderful weirdness of attachment. Infants who hang on their mother's breasts as if they were muscles or glands swollen out from her body. These poems are tender or quietly reserved or break off unexpectedly. And here, I'll break off to give you a give a coupon. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, it's always amazing to me when people actually read my poems and read them so carefully. So it's such a such a great gift. Thank you, especially those from the unbearable heart. So uh, thank you, John, for inviting me, and also Rosa for um, getting me here. <laughs> Both of you, a big pleasure, um, and for my husband Harold who arranged for us to go to uh, Alcatraz yesterday, which was fun. <laughs> I'm gonna do something I've never um, done at a reading before. I'm gonna really skip around uh, among different things that I've written. Um, and I'm gonna start with poems from The Artist's Daughter, which I wrote during a time I was um, researching historical monsters. I also want to say thank, thank you for your poetry. So before I start, I sort of rush up here and start reading. So thank you for those. And I was thinking, hmm, obsessed with history. This will be a good way to start. I'm going to open with this poem, Like Lavinia, which is a poem about premature burial. And um, I was able to use a book called, um, to glean from a book called Premature Burial and How to Prevent It from the 19th Century. Like Lavinia. Like Lavinia Merli in 1890 in Majola Mantua expired from hysteria and placed in a vault on Thursday, July 3rd, where she regained consciousness, tore at the grave's clothes her peasant husband had just smoothed around her seven month pregnant belly and where she turned over and gave birth, but was not discovered until Saturday, both mother and newborn then really dead. Like George Hefdecker of Erie, Pennsylvania, a farmer who upon suffering heart failure in 1891 was temporarily buried until the purchase of a plot and was unearthed four days later, with his fingers so bitten off his hands no longer looked human. Like Mr. Opelt, a wealthy manufacturer in Ruddenburg, whose vault, unsealed 15 years after his death, was found to contain a skeleton seated in the corner, the coffin lid off. Like the gendarme in 1889, dead drunk on potato brandy, whose banging in the coffin caused the sexton to bore holes, though the Frenchman had by then mutilated his head in an effort to burst through and was fully deceased. Like the beggar turned up frozen in a German village in 1807 and buried only to be disinterred when a watchman detected lamentations from the grave, although by that time he had indeed suffocated. Like them, yes, the air about my body dead, even in this abrupt 
consciousness. He sips his instant coffee black and turns on 1010 winds. The apartment is in the back of a storefront. The neighborhood kids piss under the door. Our bedroom is so drafty, we sleep in layers of sweats and stuff old towels in window cracks. But it isn't the boys or the draft that keeps me from opening my eyes. Not the traffic update or Dow Jones, not even that man setting his cup down on the counter to whack a mouse with a broom. If I press my ear to the pillow, I can mistake my pulse for awareness. It's the light, even when the lights are off. He closes the door on the newly hung wallpaper and the dishes soaking in sudsy gray gravy for his nightly walk down Broadway, communing with black hookers and white junkies. He is looking for oxygen. I am the wife under the fluorescent bathroom light, tweezing each hair around my sex. It vaguely hurts. It reminds me that feeling is not what I will get from him. It kills time until Miami Vice. Afterwards, the infant daughter will wake just as we lie down. There are several reported happy endings, like the farm wife, Mrs. Sarsaval, in 1891, who, while milking cows, saw beneath the floorboards a nest of snakes and fell to the ground, then presumed dead by her physician and loved ones until she sat upright in her coffin. Her daughter led the woman to the breakfast table where she ate heartily. Ah, it is amazing they are found ever. And this other one from um, the artist's daughter. It's from a section called Reckless Sonnets. Once in its life, the yucca moth alights on the yucca flower, which blooms a single evening. Imagine the black against tepid black outline and the whir of wings before the moth gathers pollen, kneads it into a ball, and travels to a second blossom where it cuts open the pistol, lays its egg inside, then stuffs the pellet into that canal. What dream informs the caterpillar? What fragrance besides death? And what hand will lift the blinds beside my bed when the lover is drinking a first cup of coffee a hundred miles away I wish I knew? And what image allows one to take that one flight? I have a little note somewhere that tells me what to do while I'm up here, so I don't fiddle around so much. Um, oh, yes. Um, I've been asked why um, the narrow road to the interior and toxic flora are so different from one another. Um, but it isn't that uh, toxic flora is a deviation from the narrow road, but really the two are separate tracks. So the narrow road to the interior is a collection of material that I um, that I had written over way over a 10, 12, 15 year period for say anthologies that asked for something on a particular topic um, and that none of them had ever made it into any of my books. So at one point I thought, oh, I'll just collect all this material and put in a nice little, you know, collection and give it to my editor. And she gave it right back to me and told me to rewrite the whole thing, um, which is absolutely right. But um, really, the artist's daughter and toxic flora have more of a relationship to one another. Um, and Narrow Road is kind of separate track. So I'm going to read just a few pieces from The Narrow Road to the Interior, which, of course, is a title I stole from Basho. The last section in the book um, attempts, in my own cheeky and shameless way, to insert myself into um, what Japanese poets have done for hundreds of years, which is 
one poet will write a poem gets placed in the in, in imperial anthology, and then another poet will write one with allusions to that. So I decided, I'm just going to do that too. So I'm going to read some of these poems uh, that were translated by Hiro Akisato. Quote, looking at the moon, I feel sad in a thousand ways, though the autumn isn't mine alone. Oe no chisato. Quote, evening mist forming in the depths of my heart. The autumn, as it wanes, is mine alone. Shikishi. The evening mist dampens his heart, I know. He will not see his way through this mist. The evening mists and my face is wet. Ah, to be mother and daughter, bereft. The evening mist forming in my heart. The one daughter runs off into that dark. The other watches. Quote, I'm waiting, I tell others, for the moon to rise above the foot-wearying mountain. But it's for you I wait. Anonymous from the Manyoshu. <clears throat> Quote, waiting for you, I do not go into my bedroom. Do not shine on its cypress door long, moon near the hills, shikishi. Who cares about the moon after all? The street lamp over the corner payphone is bright till dawn. Who cares about the moon over the skyline? Who cares about him? And who cares what I thought was my heart? So while I was organizing the narrow road to the interior, writing my subversive um, Zuihitsu and Tanka, I was beginning to put together um, a sequence of poems. Um, so there's a through line in terms of what I'm interested in doing aesthetically between the artist's daughter and toxic flora. Um, I started a sequence uh, of poems triggered by the science section of the New York Times. I thought, oh, okay, I'll have one nice, tidy little sequence. But I kept writing more until I had about 100 poems. And then, of course, I had to um, figure out what cool science stuff to take out of those poems. And that took me about 10 years. So. Um, after I figured out what stuff to take out, <laughs> I gave the book to my um, editor, and she loved it, and she gave it back to me. As she did my, <laughs> she has all my books um, that she's done. And she suggested that I actually take out the long prose sections, which are the Zuihitsu that I had written. And she felt they were overpowering the lyric poems. However, she also suggested, and there were suggestions, that I take one of these pieces and take little sections from it and kind of flip it through almost as section markers. So I took the piece on sexual cannibalism, of course. Nowadays, when friends read about Darwin and something like sexual cannibalism, they immediately expect a poem. Then there's my own jealousy of the material itself that someone will get to it first. Whatever the pressure that the female mantis devours the head of the still mating male and then moves on to the rest of his body is a shocking bit of information because I am past childbearing years because I have daughters, or because it, it just seems vulgar to eat in bed. On deceit as survival. Darwin could not believe an insect 
would visit a blossom that had no reward and insisted that the green-winged orchid must withhold its nectar deep inside. But he was deceived as well, since this orchid does not offer nectar in its own Darwinian desire to attract then rid itself of the useful bee. Still others smell like feces or carrion for the sort that prefers to lay eggs in such environs. Yet another species resembles a female bumblebee ending in trysts or appears to be two fractious males, which also attracts, no surprise, a third curious enough to join the fray. What to make of highly evolved beauty bent on deception as survival? Liposuction, rejuvenated clitoris, plumped lips. I plead with daughters to forget the enhanced buttocks and rely on soap as fragrance. But how can a mother instruct on deceit when girls so readily flaunt thigh and thong and when parking lots are replete with broken fences and the preternatural buzz of the car alarm? Toxic flora. There is something vital about the Passiflora aliquirillata, which over a million years varied its cynogens to discourage insect feasting insects, although the Helicanoas butterfly resolutely adapted to those same poisons, finally transmuting itself into one, actually repelling predators as it leisurely fluttered from leaf to blossom, seeking out a spot for eggs. What does this demonstrate about toxins or residents or carrying around a portion of the childhood home where the father instructs the daughter on the uses of poison then accuses her of being so potent? I think you actually did a better job pronouncing some of those words than I just did. I usually um, just finesse my way through. <laughs> okay, where am I going in this bird and insect section? Hold on one second. My little notes here. Nepenthe. Quaff, oh quaff, this kind Nepenthe. Edgar Allan Poe. The Nepenthe ravelsiana, or pitcher plant, a bowl shaped leaf with liquid at bottom, acts like an animal predator to attract and digest insects, such as the itinerant ant that scouts around the dry lip, then bids colony members follow only to slip inside owing to increased humidity or nectar secretion. Scientists measure this completely passive phenomenon using tiny electrical probes. Just what is the reward for such studies? Botanical insights? Lessons on symbiosis or unpredictability? For me, more than the thought of wet lips or Homer who mentioned Nepenthe as a potion to dispel one's misery, I think of memorizing poetry in the fourth grade, Edgar Allan Poe, while longing to forget the lost Lenore, composed verse after verse that implanted recollection, that drug, that conductivity, that pleasurable sensation of stumbling into memory. Just walk away, Renee. The mite harvestman, a daddy long legs, found in 400 million year old fossils, has wandered between, con between several continents without so much as a swim. A conundrum if it weren't for plate tectonics, a notion only realized in 1911 when a scientist matched up fossils on either side of the Atlantic. I think about this discovery and try to tease out a simile but really, it's better just to leave the first land animals alone, the shifting and colliding and breaking apart alone, the drifting, the sadness that marks the opening of a quest only to discover estrangement.
sustenance. The Madagascan moth alights on the sleeping magpie, insinuating its proboscis between the closed eyelids and sipping out tears for nearly an hour. Unlike other moths who use a soft-tipped snout, those of the Hermeso... Oh, boy, I'm really going to mess this up. I didn't practice this one. You know, I'm not going to read this one. It's about a dominatrix, though, if you're interested. I don't want to embarrass myself trying to read that. <laughs> a good friend of mine who was featured in The New Yorker a couple of years ago, it's her in there. Another bit of prose. In any case, the other day I thought, how rapacious, which by one definition means unscrupulous, and by another, live by eating prey. Okay, I'm going to stop jumping around and go with my earlier plan here. Read things I've actually practiced in the hotel room. Awareness. Among the burrowing owls, scraps of carpet and tin foil, tucked into the humid straw, the horde of cow dung is especially prized as it attracts dung beetles. The owls watch for hours, revealing a tool of attraction of which those clever creatures may not be aware. What then is awareness? Connecting shit to consequence, the flicker that links, say, chlorine to climax, or who consumed whom at faculty picnics. Stay with a little bird section on fidelity. <clears throat> Australian magpie larks that couple and clasp produce an alternating antiphonal song that coalesces into the call of one, an indication of how long the pair have sung duets and how faithfully they'll synchronize a defensive turf, which makes sense. Though so unsure of my own part, I'm as ready to take off in torment as I am to beat off any competitor for a nest of twigs, trinkets, and assurances. But you've heard this lament before. So before this book came out, I was uh, reading some of the poems, and um, a young man in the audience came up to me. Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's much better. Um, a young man came up to me and said, I am an editor at the Science Times. Um, if, you've ever, if you would ever like to come to one of the staff meetings, uh, they're on Tuesdays and I, you know, I could get you in. So I thought, cool. So after the book came out, um, we saw each other again at another, at another place and he uh, invited me. Um, again, and I, I took him up on the offer, so I went, I, I was on the way there and got out of the subway and I suddenly broke into a sweat and I thought, what the hell are you doing? You're going to go meet all these people whose work you've stolen from. Are you out of your mind? So I was just um, completely appalled that I had agreed to do that. Um, but I'm as I mentioned earlier, completely shameless also. So I just took my, took my book and walked right into the meeting and they were all just absolutely dazzlingly wonderful. I mean, here you're meeting the, you know, really some of the top, top science writers uh, in the country. And they were amused and charming and I was amused to see, I've, I noted that everything I steal from, I have notes in the back. I make sure everybody knows um, all the wonderful titles. For example, the first poem I read on deceit as survival is from a, um, an article called 
Orchid Sends a Not-So-Subtle Message to Bees by Carol K. Suk Yoon, and that was in the New York Times in 2004. So they're all back here. So I was very amused that, you know, as they passed the book around, they all sort of checked in the back to see <laughs> if I'd used any of their work, so that made me feel better. But I do, I cite wherever I steal from. Maud. Although the exoplanet Gliese 436b orbiting around Gliese 436 may possess a livable zone in between its fixed sunny and frigid sides, it still does not possess a more transcendent name. I'm interested in whether this exoplanet possesses atmosphere as much as the next person, but more, I'd like my daughter to watch for the wobbles that a planet's gravity creates in the motion of its stars and name these masses after family members. Kimiko would be a great name, but really I'm thinking Maud, planet Maud. To imagine qualities would be to suggest the obvious attributes a daughter might bestow on her mother, my mother. But rather than be obvious, I could take pleasure in naming any planet after her, though, if pressed, I imagine one as petite, habitable, remote, and owning a number of moons. An atmosphere, surely. There was a short time I wanted the same daughter to go into mycology to name a fungus after the men in the family. I don't think either would be asking too much. <clears throat> the search for names. The right to name Planet X belonged to the Lowell Observatory, where the Kansas farm boy engaged to photograph night heavens using a blink comparator quickly suggested Sliffer after his superior. The widow, Constance Lowell, suggested Zeus, Lowell, and Constance. Then 11-year-old Venetia Burney put forward Pluto, ruler of the underworld, as well a dark and cold terrain, and a god who could turn invisible. She was eating breakfast with her grandfather, Falconer Madden, when he read about the search in the dailies. Lucky girl, fortunate planet, exultant netherworld. Sedna. Come to find out Sedna is the Inuit woman whose father cast her from their kayak, thus transforming her into the spirit of the sea, but also the name of 2003 VB12, a planet or something beyond Pluto. It is the first body to be discovered in the Oort cloud, a hypothetical region of icy objects that become comets. But questions remain. How can a region be hypothetical? How can a scientist not know what a planet is? How could a father throw his daughter from a kayak, even if she did write poetry that hurt his feelings? I am not sorry. He always said, art comes first. But that is a murky region for fathers and daughters. What comes first? And what my daughters wish to know is, did she drown for his sake or to learn how depths betray? Moving into the miscellaneous section, out of the astronomy section. Big feathered hats worn by women a century ago would necessitate aligning the body in a threshold just so. It's this just so 
that intrigues Professor Iriki, who has probed clumps of tissue to uncover how cells and circuits map the world around it to the body's schema, to sense that tight spot, whether concrete or like the night her lover admitted he'd had an affair with his own mother, his word, affair, and she knew in her bones, which was really her brain, that she should get the fuck out, those feathers, that exit. You can see I had a lot of fun writing these. The soul, quote, I addicted myself to the opening of heads, Thomas Willis. A physician of King Charles II, Willis was intrigued by the curious quilted ball, receiver of animal electricity, but could not bring himself to identify the brain as the bodily home of the soul. But why cite region on behalf of invisible impulse? What prompts one child to warn her mother that she doesn't want to read about her affairs with boys in muscle cars, but that she is glad to know the collections will survive her as a keepsake of extreme explanation, and prompts the other to write so viciously of family vacations the father renounces her. Why open the skull as daily enterprise? Why research what is transparent? Why not see the soul for what it is, that sideswipe, that riptide, that addiction to human remains? I'm going to swerve into um, also something I haven't done before, which is to read um, from a new collection. I think it's a collection. We'll find out. I thought I was finished with the Science Times, but apparently it's, it isn't finished with me. So um, a year and a half ago, I was supposed to start writing. I'd given my assignment to start writing one thing. And of course, I ended up writing more Science Times poems, almost all of these on um, neuroscience. And instead of using one article per poem, I use one article and then just kind of go crazy. I think that's what's good. <laughs> we'll see what happens. But um, I'd like to try them out on you. I ran out of. Um, this is from a section on dream theory. The dream of parsnips. Do I wish for a box of cigars or dynamite? Do I wish for the earth's dense smell of earthworm? Do I wish for the standing outside his lit office window at 2 a.m. in the mor at 2 in the morning as only a sophomore can stand? Do I wish for Grandma Ida's table or the prefix, for the researcher herself who believes that dreaming is not a parallel state, but consciousness itself in the absence of the senses input. Given the various explanatory projects, I do wish that wishing would take care of whatever calls up an object so spare and spectacular. The dream of bubbles. The unborn may be seeing something long before the eyes ever open, making sense of both Mr. Bubble or Champagne and why I can't visit the museum, giant squid and whale diorama. Also the reason I can't open my eyes in pool or pond to witness the weight of loan and why I can't bear the chatter of toddlers as if listening from the bottom of the ocean. Can I burst the surface? After all, the developing brain draws on innate biological models of space and time. Fear blue, fear green, 
stay clear of aquamarine. The dream of toast, burnt before pop, burnt before black, burnt before taste of charcoal, burnt before, before firecrackers at the public pool and sparklers stuck into weeds on my seventh birthday with as many candles, burnt before two, the breakfast table, because dreams are merely a physiological warm up before one wakes up. I rise and shower and eat whatever alarm is set on the counter before martini, before computer failure, before a random street murder. The dream of a letter opener in the shape of a mermaid. Tell me which ocean is warmest. Tell me which shore is closest. Tell me which ship tosses trash and which plays a waltz and how many bottles you've collected containing messages from shipwrecks. Is this figure playing in my mind an unconscious desire or archetypal theme? Or are these explanations merely predetermined ideas, assumptions made science? Not wishing to jam the round peg in that square, I also don't wish to submit to gastrointestinal, intestinal or neurological pleasures. Tell me about the sister in a glass case, a monkey's body glued to that of a fish. And I'm going to end with this one. The dream of knife, fork, and spoon. I can't recall where to set the knife and spoon. I can't recall which side to place the napkin or which bread plate belongs to me or how to engage in benign chatter. I can't recall when more than one fork, which to use first, or what to make of this bowl of water. I can't see the place cards or recall any names. The humiliation is impressive, the scorn. No matter how much my brain revises the dinner to see if the host was a family member, I can't recall which dish ran away with which spoon? Thank you. I don't know, John, if you wanted a Q&A or if that's uncool here and you want me to just it's sign books very, or? Very, cool. very good, OK. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I like to use research a lot um, in my work. So I've had this problem over the years. So for example, stealing from Flaubert's letters. That was a tough one. <laughs> because how do you like rise to obviously not his level, but how do you challenge yourself to even deserve to use, to use that gorgeous stuff? Um, you know, as I've, and as I've said a number of times, I'm, I'm kind of shameless in that regard, so I would just go ahead and do it, but, but really it's an extraordinary challenge. Um, and the same thing with found material, whether it's from, you know, premature burial and how to prevent it, or whether it's from a textbook on, uh, you know, an, an entomology textbook, to find this really gorgeous language and then figure out how to include it, paraphrase it, um, um, and adore it finally, but to really, 
to honor that at, at the same time that I'm, you know, doing my creative thing with it. So um, where I actually lift quotes in the, in the in toxic flora for um, where I actually look, I, I italicize, so I indicate where I, I've done that. Um, but the really tough part was, as I said earlier, taking out absolutely fascinating, wonderful material, but I had a couple friends who were reading and just said, this could go, it doesn't really benefit the poem, and I was just holding on to it for a very long time. So that was, maybe that was hard, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, I would just, well, I, it seemed like the articles you were quoting from were impersonal and objective, mm -hmm. and you were not. Right. Really right. Well, I also, um, I mean, you know, a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people um, are writing using uh, outside sources. Um, and what I really try and do to challenge myself is to always ask what I have at stake in the material itself, so that there's some kind of connection for me. Well, I guess I just repeated myself, but, um, and oftentimes that comes in the language itself, more often than not, so I'll try and turn on a word, like transparent or something, where I go from the literal word to the association and then just kind of go my own way, so, <laughs> or an image. If not, that's okay too. Yeah, Jeffrey. So in the Penthe, you um, start by describing an ant stumbling down the interior of the planet. Right. And then it ends, I think, with stumbling into memory as a pleasure. And so I wonder whether you think, again, this is sort of a, a science question. Um, is the relation of natural description to s social desires and emotions analogical? Like, what would you describe as the kind of correspondence? moments where you're just producing physical descriptions and processes and moments where you sort of make them over into social facts. Is analogy the right term for it or would you use some other term? Huh. I don't know if I've ever used a term. <laughs> I guess I would use the word stumble, <laughs> that I kind of stumble into the material itself. So, and I think I rewrote the end to that. I did. I wrote I wrote that, I revised, and you and I were talking earlier about the book Poetic Closure by Barbara Hernstein Smith. So I kept looking at what I had repeated and what was going on in the article, and then as I swerved into more subjective material, finally trying to figure out what would best, what in the last few lines would best serve the poem, given all the different things that were going on, and I can't remember what I had before, but stumbling, <laughs> literally the word stumbling, and then the idea of Nepenthian memory um, sort of happened, and that seemed the best closure. Doesn't really answer your question, though. <laughs> Not so much analogy as stumbling. tricking my way into the material itself, so, yeah. Yes, um, do you see yourself as a poet in the world, or, I mean, a, or an isolated poet, um, a public poet, or a private poet? Hmm. Um, well, I certainly am isolated uh, when I write, although my husband more often than not is sitting at the table across from me. But, you know, it's that kind of isolation. But I, um, do you mean a public person that I write for the public in a way? Um, well, I like to be, I, you can probably tell I'm a ham, I really like to engage with people. I, lo I love reading. I have friends who uh, never, almost, almost never read at all. So I understand that, you know, 
my inclination, which is to read and and love feedback and engagement, I understand that there are some people who really, uh, it's very, very tough for them if they do it at all. So I would say in that regard, I'm public. I also love to speak. I love to speak about things that um, may seem, have nothing to do with my poetry. So I would talk about politics. I would talk about science. So um, I'm a public person in that regard. And I'm also a poet, so I guess I'm a public poet. <laughs> I'm getting good at not answering questions. Anybody else have a question I decide not to answer directly? <laughs> Well, all those things are, I mean, it's, it, when people ask me, for example, about, um, you know, am I political? What about my political poetry, of which I have a whole book? Um, and I, I certainly in my youth came out of political movements. Um, and I, it's very important for me to engage socially. Um, my writing um, often starts more with connecting particular diction that almost has a texture for me or that I can feel in my mouth. So it starts with language and imagery and then I move forward. And in the case of science, the world of science for me is very, very exotic and interesting. So that I'm able to do that and have many of the poems um, address directly and indirectly very important issues of our day um, makes me happy <laughs> that the poems can do all that at once. Um, not all my poems um, can do that. Some are more personal. Um, but I also grew up with the you know phrase personal is political and I I think that's true too. Now I can read any poem and by context shift the shift the poem into a different dimension. So for example, um, I was once asked 15 years ago, if not more, to read um, at a homeless shelter to benefit the homeless shelter. And a lot of the poets were reading poems about homelessness and I thought, I've never really been homeless before. I could write a poem about that certainly. Um, but I decided to read a love poem because in a homeless shelter there's very little room for privacy. And so I could take that poem and put it, shift it in a different context and that's how I was political at that moment. So um, again, I'm not answering your question <laughs> um, or I'm shifting the question. Um, I start with material that is important to me artistically and then I, I work with that and sometimes it addresses social issues, sometimes not. But the, the environment and issues of extinction, whether the extinction is that of a species or language, um, a friend of mine, Bob Holman, is working on a documentary on extinct languages or languages that are about to become extinct, and he's recording that. I mean, all those things are you know, enormously important, so, yeah, so. That music sounds like, oh, okay. There's <laughs> a question, yes. Uh, when you're writing about a scientific idea in a poem, are you, are you hoping that your readers are gonna be intrigued enough to follow up on it? I would love that. I would love if they look at the um, articles in the back and Google them, um, and because you can just go right to those archives, or at least until the time starts charging, <laughs> we can go right to those archives and then read about them. I, I think that would, be really wonderful in order to do that. And that way, I hope that it's a little teasing and seductive, yeah, to have that additional relationship to the material. Yeah, 
Thank you. That would have been really interesting music to read to. <laughs> I think it is too. So thank you very much. Thank you.